good morning. And I know you've already had, some of you, a really big morning already. And uh, hopefully your heartbeat and your pulse rate's getting down to a normal level. But uh, I want to welcome you all to our, is it our third already? Fourth, oh my God. Fourth annual um, Horse Mastership Week. And we want to thank all of the sponsors, of course, Lendon, Annie, who's been working her tail off to make all this happen, everybody who's given to and supports this week for you guys. And uh, I just think it's a fantastic week. And I'm glad, too, that it's more open to auditors this time around uh, because I think that the the more we have people that are coming to watch, not only family members, but local trainers and um, and just, you know, the community, the the more everybody learns and the bar is raised by that, right? So uh, hopefully we'll have enough seating for everyone. And um, what we're going to be talking about this morning is the basic principles of the art of dressage. So how many of you guys have been in a Horse Mastership Week program with me before? So quite a few of you, right? Okay, and how many of you remember this lecture? Like really well? <laughs> you remember that I said that I did the lecture. <laughs> the, the idea being that this one lesson, this one lecture, is really the thing that I was taught by my mentor as being the singular lesson. Okay? So once I understood that this was the lesson and that everything sprouted in my training and my riding out of this lesson, I recognized the fact that if I didn't memorize it, if I didn't really know it at a, you know, at a visceral level inside myself, then I still didn't understand what I was doing. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is that if there's one thing that you really take home it's this hour's conversation. All right? Got it? Okay. So <clears throat> the, the idea of dressage, do you know what dressage means? What does dressage mean? Training. What? Training. Training. In what language? French. French. Okay. And how long ago did it start? How long ago? Phoebe? Absolutely. In the time of Socrates, in the time of a, the wartime in ancient Greece and a guy called Xenophon who saw that horses and especially the stallions out at play were doing all of these fancy things and prancing around and rearing and kicking out backwards and says to himself, you know, if we could harness that and put that to our own use against the foot soldiers of the other side, think of how much more effective we could be as a fighting army. And so the first school of dressage began to train the horses for warfare. Okay? And then what happened was, as the centuries went by, and we got to around the 15th century, the courts, and you know how like if you go, if, maybe you guys haven't been to Europe, but in Europe, there are a lot of different little areas that all had their castles. And those were called the feudal times. And they, each of the castles had their, their king and their queen and their high court. And when there was not a war going on, they would have these things called Ross Ballets, horse ballets. And they would be, so that the court and the royalty would be um, 
entertained by the riders and the horses doing these beautiful things to live music, okay? So, and from then, dressage went on into the, the modern Olympics. So it was even in the ancient Olympics, back in that time of Xenophon, that dressage was one of the five, or, or riding was one of the five noble arts and then taken through all those centuries and then brought forward to the modern day Olympics as the sport that we know it, okay? So um, dressage therefore is both an art and a sport. And the, in order to do it well, you have to understand with any art, you have to first learn the craft of it. You have to first learn, if I want to be a great painter, just because I want to be Michelangelo doesn't mean I'm going to be able to take some paint and some brushes and, and paint just like Michelangelo, right? I have to do the years of work and I have to do it under such good supervision that I'm going to learn first the mechanics of it, why things work the way they work, how to put a uh, place uh, the picture in the middle of the canvas, how to shade and how to make it look like the art that I'm trying to project from my mind. Okay? Think of what I just said there because there was something important in the last sentence that I said there. So then, we're going to talk about what these basic principles are. What do you think then, once a horse has been has been like lunged under saddle and now we're going to ride him, right? So he's, he's broke now to ride. What's the first requirement that all horses have to learn before they can learn to do anything else? To go. To, to, to go forward. Forward is the first requirement, okay? So in order to make them go forward, we have a set of aids. The set of aids is called the set of driving aids. There are three natural driving aids. And I say natural because we are not in the dressage arena allowed, especially at the international levels, to be, uh, well, we're not in any levels allowed to be going, come on boy, come on boy, let's go. And we're not allowed to be using the whip in the international levels, okay? So we have three natural aids. And what do you suppose, and let's hear some people from down here that haven't been, what do you suppose would be the three aids that are the driving aids? Any ideas down here? Leg, sorry? Leg aid and seat. And anybody else? There's, I said three. Pardon? Your hands. Anybody else? Your right and left leg. And your seat and your hands. And anybody else? Anybody else? Nobody else. Got no more takers. Okay, so let's do this. Let's say that we're going to put forward a hypothesis. You guys know what a hypothesis is? It's an educated guess. And you guys have to agree with me or disagree with me, okay? And that is that an aid has to prove that it truly is an aid within the set of aids that we're talking about by virtue of the fact that it has to independently by itself produce at least partially that quality that you desire within the horse. Is that fair? Okay. So you said, you said a bunch of things. You said legs, you said seat aid, and you said hands. So if I put you on your horses right now and you're imagining you're on your horses and you have no legs whatsoever, you have no seat whatsoever, can you push your horse forward with your hands? Can you push him forward with your hands? Right? So the, the, the hands have no function in the creation of forward motion. But you said something very interesting. What's your name? Hallie. Hallie. You said something really interesting. You said left leg and right leg. Because they're, they're independent. So if each of you use just your left leg really hard, if you kick your horse with your left leg hard, you think he's going to go forward? He may go a little sideways, but you think he'll go forward? Absolutely. And likewise with your right leg, he'll go forward. 
Now, we come back to the third of the three driving aids, and you were right to say your seat. But right now, are we all sitting with a driving seat like while we're, while we're sitting here? So our seats are passive right now, right? How do we make the passive seat into a driving aid? How would you think? What do you do? Um, by pushing. But what do you mean pushing? Like... What do you do? Like, what do you, yeah? Uh, like, use your core and, like, have a your Okay, you said use your core. Okay, BB. You take your energy. You take your energy. How, how do you get your energy? How do you get your energy? Do you guys know how you get your energy? This is really important stuff now. How do you get your energy? That's, this is the most important thing of, of just about anything. Do you know that? You have an answer. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. This is where I, this is where I begin my, my, my making myself look silly, but this is how it works. Okay, so the great diver goes up to the end of the platform, has his or her dive already in her mind, right? Has visualized the dive that she's going to do, right? She goes up and she clears her mind first of everything other than the dive that she is going to do. And then she's going to then crouch down in order to in order to be able to spring but what do you think she's going to do at the second as she's crouching down what'd she do what did she do she breathed in she, do you know where your energy comes from guys Oxygen, oxygen is where your energy comes from. Oxygen going into your lungs, going then into your bloodstream and then flowing through your bloodstream to all your muscles everywhere in your body every minute. Oxygen is what makes us stay alive and oxygen is what creates every next moment in our lives of motion, of action, of anything that we do energetically, you get that? So the breath is the singular, um, is the singular idea that runs through all sports and most arts, okay? Say the opera singer, have you ever watched opera at all? Maybe some of you like it, maybe some of you don't like it, but you ever watched it on TV or anything? Did you ever see an opera singer walk out onto the stage? Did you ever see them walk out like this? You know, they stand there like this. They walk out like this, right? They stand there, and then they take in this tremendous breath, and out comes this unimaginable sound, right? The, the um, gymnasts, have you guys watched gymnastics? Have you watched them come out onto the onto the floor, do they walk like this? They're, they walk like this, right? And then, and then right before they start, and this is the same in fencing, before in fencing, as you go to go here, you take in a breath, breathe out, okay? And in weightlifting, if Mike talks to you about weightlifting, when you bring the weight down, you breathe in, and you go, and you breathe out, and you pump the weight out. Do you get that? So the breath in, is the beginning of activating your core. Somebody said their core. Absolutely. So when you, right now, sit up tall, everyone. Take in a deep breath and tighten all of the muscles from your stomach up through your chest. Throw your shoulder blades backwards. Tighten those muscles right here in your back. Tighten all the way down through your buttocks, okay? Tighten all the way down. Now you have what's called a braced seat. 
okay? With that Bray seat, the, the things that you guys said that, that were right was that you take your seat that is braced and you then push as if you, can you remember when you were little, little kids and you were, you were right next to your best friend on a swing set? And you said, I'm gonna race you to the top, okay? Now your feet were dangling. You probably couldn't even touch the ground, but you would breathe in as you go back and you breathe out and push the swing with your seat up that way. And each time you came back, you breathe in and each time you breathe out. And you didn't even know you were breathing in and breathing out. That's the interesting thing about that. We do it reflexively. But then the one that got to the top, whatever you won, you won. And then, but the idea is that you were using the driving seat. And in the same way, the pushing that swing or pushing the cantle of the saddle toward the pommel of the saddle in that movement drives the horse that is sensitive. Remember, he's so sensitive that if a fly lands on his side, he goes like this with just that skin. That's how sensitive that they can be. We may tend to desensitize them to those things, but that's how then the driving seat makes the horse go, oh, and you say, thank you, boy, that's it. And then you can get to where you just breathe in and the horse starts going forward, right? Because he knows that in the next second you might drive with your seat. And the same way as the leg just even begins to come close to them, they move forward because they get more and more understanding of what that all means. Do you see that? So once these driving aids work, then we make the horse more and more sensitive so that the lightest amount of that aid creates the greatest possible result. So now we have a horse that's going forward off the driving aids. But we have to him also have a second quality on in his training. And that quality is called straightness. Straightness means the ability of the horse to go over the line that he's moving along such that his hind feet are following exactly in the footprints of his front feet on the same side. And so like he's a segment of the circle or the straight line that he's overlapping, right? That means that he has to be able to be bent on bent lines, right? So which means that we have to have a set of aids. So we have a set of aids called the set of bending aids. And just like there were three driving aids, there are three bending aids. What are the three bending aids? Somebody here. What do you think? Your hands and your individual legs. Your hands and your individual legs. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Yeah? The seat, okay. Anybody else have any other thoughts? I have hands, seat, and legs. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna go back through our hypothesis again. And I'm gonna say to you, if you guys are now, you're up on your horses, imagine you're on your horse right now, okay? You're up on your horse and you have no legs and you have no reins whatsoever. Can you bend your horse right now to the left by your seat? You have no legs, no reins. Can you bend your horse by your seat? No. You'd be turning blue before your horse would bend <laughs> by your seat because your seat up there can't bend the animal laterally. Do you see? From nose to tail. So the seat, we throw that out. What about this? You have no inside rein, you have no legs. Can you bend your horse to the inside by pulling on the outside rein? No. You're gonna, it's gonna go the other way. So the outside rein has no function in the creation of bend to the inside. But we're left with three aids. Inside leg, outside leg, inside rein. Guess what? Those are the three bending aids. Inside legs put where? Where? at the girth. Everybody always knows that. You know that? If you take 100 pony clubbers and put them in this ring and line them up, and you said, where do you put your inside leg? They go, at the girth, at the girth, at the girth, at the girth. Okay, and which is great. And then I say, why? Why the girth? What's so important about the girth? And the girth isn't just the strap that is holding the saddle on. The girth is the area under which we are seated on the horse. So that's the clue right there. So why do we begin pushing the horse into a bend from our inner leg at the girth? Why the girth? Why? The center of their balance. 
It's a, it's a center of their balance. It's the center of gravity of the horse, and that's why we're sitting above it. If it were an elephant, we'd be sitting sort of much closer to their ears. And if it was a donkey, we would be sitting much closer to the tail. Okay? But for a horse, that's their center of gravity. So we begin changing his balance at his center of balance, and we use our inner leg at the girth. But the horse says, okay, I feel that pressure. I'm just going to throw my butt outwards. So now how do we prevent his butt from going out? Outside leg is brought backward slightly to be used as a barrier to prevent the hindquarters from swinging out from the pressure of our inner leg. Now we have the horse bent from the girth backwards, but we need the horse to be bent equally from the girth forward to the nose, right? So by closing our inside hand into a fist, just enough that the horse yields and brings his head and neck in with the exact bend that we've created in the horse's trunk, in the horse's body, from our legs, we create a horse that is properly bent from nose to tail. And just like I was talking about the driving aids, once the horse is sensitive to these aids and says, oh, okay, I bend, then you say, okay, I can relax my aids now until I need them again. Does that make sense? Do it, the lightest possible aids for the grant perfect results. So now, though, we come to a problem, and that is, now you're on your horses again, right? And I say, go up onto that circle, drop your outside rein, pick up your inside rein tight, and as hard as you can, I want you to drive with your driving aids, and I want you to bend with your bending aids. So it's inside rein tight, inner leg at the girth, outer leg behind the girth, using your seat, your legs, and your inside rein, what is your horse gonna wanna do? Where? You're using your outside leg really strong, Inside rein really strong, inner leg really strong, okay? You got your seat really driving. Is the horse going to go the same speed or is it going to want to speed up? Speed up. Is he going to just go straight because you're using your bending aids really hard? What do you think he's going to do? Circle. And he's going to go circling around and around and around. Or the only other possibility is he'll bend part of himself and go that way really fast. Right? Which, like a lot of thoroughbreds, would, might do. Either way, you produced more bend than you wanted from the bending aids and more, more speed from the driving aids. So that means that there has to be one set of aids left at our disposal, and it's one aid, but it's a set by itself, that has the job of telling the horse that just because we're using our driving aids doesn't mean you use allowed to speed up necessarily, and just because we're using our bending aids doesn't mean he's allowed to bend more than we want. What do you think that one aid that was left is? What do you think? Well, we were using our seat to drive. It's one aid that we didn't use in the others. Yeah, the outside rein, right? The outside rein was dropped. So the outside rein is called the aid or the rein of opposition. You guys know what opposition means? It means to oppose means to go against. So by closing the outside hand into a fist as we are driving with our seat and legs, we say, yeah, I'm driving you, but sorry, you're not allowed to speed up any more than this. And he says, okay, I'll, give, I'll yield to that outside hand in a fist. And then what we do is we begin to create a sense of rhythm with the horse and tempo. Do you understand? So then, and likewise, if we're using our bending aids, inner leg at the girth, outer leg behind the girth, inside right, and he says, I think I want to bend like a, like a pretzel now. But we close our outside hand into the fist and we say, no, thank you, just this amount of bend. And he says, okay, I yield to that outside hand. And, and he says, I'll only bend this much that you allow me to bend. Do you see? And so we now have this beautiful package of aids. We have the set of driving aids, the set of bending aids, and the aid or the reign of opposition. The first two creating forwardness and proper bend, and the second one, and the third one rather, that is in charge of regulating the amount of the first two. You got it? So now, here's the great news about this, that if we take these three sets of aids and are able to marry them together in the length of time of guess what? 
a complete breath. Remember we talked about the breath? We have the ability to adjust all sorts of things, okay? So, when a horse goes in perfect balance, right, in, um, he's out in the field and he's perfectly balanced and he's really proud, how does he look? Does he look like our dressage horses that are going around in the Grand Prix? Isn't that interesting? Because, see, that's the whole idea of why they thought, wow, this dressage stuff could be really cool for us, whether we're going in a battle or whether we're doing these ballets or whatever we're gonna do, because if we can make them stay in perfect balance, they look gorgeous, don't they? And they, they're all flowing and with all this expression and it's, it's beautiful. So our job is to try to maintain them in this perfect state of balance and attention. Now, the, the horse that is going from a walk to a trot, as he goes faster, where does his center of gravity go? You think back? Okay, you guys were just running up there. The runner's up there. When you ran, here's where when we're standing still is our center of gravity, right? When you went to run, where did your center of gravity go? Back or forward? Forward. forward. Same thing for horses, okay? So the faster we go, the more our center of gravity wants to go forward. Now imagine that you had somebody that um, you were giving a piggyback ride to while you were doing that running. Would that, change, would that have changed everything? Yeah, because you're giving a piggyback ride while trying to run, meaning that you have to, uh, you have to change the way you're balancing in order to maintain your balance so you don't fall down. That's what the horse is always worried about. You know that? That's his biggest concern once you're riding around on him, that he's going to fall down, that he's going to lose his balance. And so he has two natural balancing tools. One of them is his head and neck. That's a big, heavy thing. So they raise their head and neck as they start to lose their balance. Just like a little baby, when they start to learn to walk, they walk like, like this, don't they? Right? But as we learn to be able to balance ourselves, we're able to walk like that and get up on a balance beam and do all these fancy things like this and then jump and do a somersault and land right there and then it's not to help. You got it? So here's where the idea is in. The, we're going to Ten percent of the horse's weight is going to go forward. That's the, by the nature of it, of going faster, okay? So if we take in a breath, we breathe in, right? We create that, what, what, was, what do we call it? The what kind of a seat? The what? Well, before it's driving, it's, it becomes something else. Braced, right? Okay, so we brace our seat. We're going to close our legs. Say we're on the circle going 20 meters to, to the left right here. Our inner leg's at the girth. Our outer leg is behind the girth. And our inside rein is doing its usual job of bending the horse to the left from our inside hand. And the horse is going to say, that second, up oh, my mom, she's telling me to, to go faster and more. But at the second, you close your outside hand into a fist, thereby closing an imaginary door in front of his nose. That open would have allowed him to speed up and bend more. But now close says, you have to yield, boy, right here. You're not allowed to speed up and you're not allowed to bend even more. And so if he's not allowed to speed up, you're driving, right? And, you're, and the bend is correct. And, you're, and he says, I'm yielding here. I'm not allowed to speed up. What's going to happen to his hind legs if this door is closed in front of him? What are his hind legs going to do? You're about to say it. What? They're going to come under, meaning they're going to bend more in the joints, right? And if the joints of the hind legs bend more, what happens to the horse's butt, the top of his butt? Does it go up or down? It goes down. And if, the, and if his butt goes down, what happens to his front end? It goes up, but he's yielded to the action of the outside fist and the inner hand that's bending him so that he's giving in here. So where does it go up from? not his head and neck, it goes up from his withers and shoulders, right? And at that second, remember the 10% of his weight that 
was going to go forward when he goes from the walk to the trot? Well, at the second when his butt did that, what do you think his center of gravity went? It went backward, right? So we took the 10% and said, hey, I'm going to push your hind legs more underneath, and now you're down here, and now in the second while you're down here, I'm also going to dictate to you with my seat and leg through my hand the trot. And he goes into the trot, and you've taken 10% of his weight back. The 10% by nature has gone back forward. Guess where we are? Exactly where we were before. Do you get that? And that's the beauty of dressage, that we're constantly from, from one second to the next having the ability to breathe in, close legs, close fist, dictate that which we desire and we see. Remember what I said in one of my first sentences that the swimmer came, or the diver came onto the platform and what was the diver doing when he was coming up to the platform, coming up to that moment? visualizing so we are going to dictate that which we see in our mind's eye as the next thing that we want from our horse and this whole thing that was married into the time of the breath is called what do you think say it louder that's the half halt the half halt is a calling of the horse to a perfect state of balance and attention that's what it is by definition. And it's done through the marriage of the three sets of aids and the amount of each set of aids within each half halt dictates in that half halt the next movement, the next gait, the next pace, the next bend, the next balance that we want from the horse. Do you understand? So. What riders get as they go through their life and become trainers and they've learned this craft and then they take it forward into art is that we don't ride like in, a, in the dressage test. We're not riding just the dressage test thinking, okay, MXK extend trot, uh, you know, K collected trot, A collected canter, and you know, just doing them. We are thinking half halt here we're seeing the whole thing like a movie in our, mind, in our mind, right? And from half halt to half halt, we're seeing that next grandest version in our inner vision in our mind of us and our horses going along from the one half halt. And this is where now I'll, I'll do my second and not my last silly thing that you'll think is... Uh, especially if it's ever on YouTube or whatever, that, that looks ridiculous of me. But the idea would be, say the horse is cantering, right? And you want to bring it to around the corner. And you can feel as it's coming up to the corner that its attention wants to be outside of the arena, right? And it's not going to be balanced. And you have to go across the diagonal and you have to do this incredible extended canter. So. You don't get yourself nervous. You take in a breath, you close your legs, and the horse is cantering, and he's looking up here, and you say, under, under, under. And he gives in the length of time of the complete breath, which is basically like three strides. It can be shorter, it can be a little longer, but I love three. Three is a powerful number, okay? So think in terms of the half halt, the complete breath. Breathe in, breathe out. That's about three strides, okay? And so it, the, if that half halt didn't work, then I've seen the, the rider that says, okay, well, that didn't work. I'll do the next half halt. And I'll strengthen those aids that the horse didn't listen to in the half halt before. If it was too much halt and not enough half, in other words, if the horse slowed down and didn't bend its hind legs and come forward, then I have to use my legs more. If, if the horse just pulled straight out and ran forward, I have to be able to use my more halt and less half. Do you see? But it's the, the finally, the creating of the, the, the this, it's like, and, and you guys aren't old enough to think about this, but it would be like creating a cocktail. You have to put in just the right amount of everything to make it perfect. Or baking a cake, how about that? That you put in just the right amounts to make that cake be just perfect. 
okay? So you have to know how much seat, how much leg, how much rain. There is one final thing that I wanted to talk to you about, though, besides these half halts, and then, ask, and then you can ask some questions. And that is, say your horse is going around right here in the ring, and suddenly your horse takes the bit in its teeth and says, I am running you straight out off of this farm and straight back down, down Pearson Road. Are you going to be sitting in, with a passive seat? Are you going to be sitting, are you going to be driving them with your seat? So there's one other way that the seat is of use. And remember when we talked about the brace seat? The seat is then, I'm sure it's going to be braced, right? And you're going to be probably holding on with your, your upper leg. And that's called the, the rider sitting against the motion of the horse. In downward transitions, from greater to lesser, from extended to collected, from canter to trot, you'll want to use the half halt, thinking in terms of using the brace seat that sits against the motion of the horse, and using more upper leg as opposed to the driving lower leg, and using just enough of that fist to bring the horse down in the transition. By using that upper leg and that braced seat against the motion of the horse, the back of the horse is more likely to stay up and the roundness more steady. The driving seat is, and with the lower leg through the closed outside fist, is the one that we would go the upward trend, the, the walk to trot, the trot to canter, the collected to extended. You got that? So this is why I said it's the, as we get the half halts and we, we practice them and we practice them and we practice them thousands and thousands of times over thousands of hours, we refine the tools so that we understand that that if we use the minimum amount of this, we get the perfect result from it. Do you get that? And that's the beauty of all of this, because what it, this is, is two different things, really, at the same time. We're talking about training horses, right? We're talking about training dressage, but we're also talking about artwork. And we're talking about some energy. Remember we talked about energy? So the idea is that in order to have the horse always perfectly balanced and always perfectly prepared for every single thing that we're going to ask of him or her, he's got to be constantly having energy that is recirculating through his or her body, right? And we're sitting there, and you've seen the very best of them, right? Where you've, you've watched on, on Clip My Horse or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, you've watched Vallegro going around and, and all the greats going around, and you see them going, and the energy is just constantly flowing, and the rider gets to do these very, very little tiny things that we don't even see anymore. That's the idea of dressage, invisible aids, right? And yet the horse is doing these amazing things, and the energy is always flowing through, always flowing through, always flowing through. And what shape is that? Circle. It's a circle. And it's a circle of the aids, and it's like a circuit of electricity. So when the circuit is a full circle where the horse always has that positive energy going through, and it's always suppled and, and, and recirculating through, you get a round, beautiful circle and a round, beautiful horse moving with round, beautiful steps. Whereas, if the circuit is broken, and it can be broken from all sorts of different reasons, it can be broken because the rider's bouncing, and the horse goes, oh, that's not comfortable. I don't know what, or, or the hands are moving, or, or the horse is being hung on to instead of half halted and given, or it can be so many different reasons, or the horse just is, says, I have no idea what you're talking about, honey. You know, I'm just a horse and I'm just going to run along. If you kick me, I'll go, and if you pull on me, I'll stop, but I have no idea what the marriage of those aids means. And your job is to train them what that means. You get that? So that we have this beautiful circuit of energy, and the energy 
is what is making all of these beautiful things that you see from Vallegro and the great horses of today, from Laura Graves horse, from Stefan Peters horse and Gunters and all of the guys that are here training you this week, that they're able to create energy, they're able to recirculate that energy and mold that energy from half halt to half halt into all of the beautiful movements that we see in dressage. So my final thought to you is the half halt is not the means to the end. In other words, the half halt to the great rider is not just the means to making all these movements happen in the arena. The half halt is the end in itself. The half halt is what we train year after year after year to make it perfect because we know that if we can do a perfect half halt and bring the horse to a perfect state of balance and attention, then every single thing is possible. You get that? Okay. So with that, how much time do we still have? Great. Questions. Like, I, I, want, I hope somebody has some questions because I still have a million questions about all this. And inquisitiveness, you know, wanting to know why things work the way they work and what to do. And if you have a particular problem with your horse that you're going to be riding or you want to know something, you know, about any of it, now's the moment to, to ask some questions. All right? Anybody have one? Go ahead. So in the three strides of the half halt, is your release included in the three strides? Yeah, the, the half halt goes in in this way. You breathe in, you close your legs, and you do this to the degree of, that the horse is trained to understand. So remember I said, the amount that you close your legs, whether they're upper leg, lower leg, the amount that you drive your seat or still your seat, and the amount that you close your fist will be dependent upon how well schooled your animal is. So the less schooled horse, that will be a stronger amount of that. And you'll say, come on, really come under it, bend your hind legs. We have to see the change. We have to see the, and feel and know the change of, of balance is occurring. And then the breath out is the reward of that half halt. So you have two parts of the half halt, and that was great that you asked that. You have the breath in, which is the dictation of the new balance, bend, gait, pace, or movement, and the breath out and the relaxation of that outside hand that now, remember we closed the door in front of his nose? Well, now he's done exactly, he's come to that perfect balance, so we open the door back up and we say, oh, thank you, sir, you may now proceed forward through to the next thing, through this doorway that I've created for you into the extended trot, for instance. And now I get to the end of the extended trot and I breathe in, I sit against the horse's motion, I use a little more upper leg than lower leg, close my outside fist, and I say, and now the door is closed again and he says, okay, I come under, and this one, oh my gosh, I'm going to come under all the way to a passage. And I passage, and the, the rider goes, thank you very much. You can go through this doorway. I breathe out. I relax the fist. You see, that's all happened in the three steps or even one step sometimes or four steps. But I like, as I said, three. So does, do you get that? Yeah. yeah. And that's the beauty of it. When you see these horses that can do extended canter right to G and then come in one stride, collected canter, and then do a double pirouette there. Do you know why? Because the distance, the, tr the true distance between the greatest extension and the grandest collection is the thought. Isn't that amazing? So the half halt that the horse so well understands by the time that they've gotten to that place makes him so that when he's in, the greatest extended trot or the greatest extended canter, he's never lost one little bit of his collection. And when he's in the most collected trot, which is what? What's the most collected trot? Piaf. Piaf. When he's in the most collected trot, he's going, I'm just trotting across a field. I'm trotting just, you know, like this. And the rider goes, yep, you think that thought, boy. You think that thought, you just stay on the bit and you just keep trotting on the, you know, across that field because that's the horse who's saying, I'm going forward, I'm thinking forward, everything's great, I'm happy. And 
there's no tension in there. He's just trotting on the spot, right? So in the, within the greatest collection, the grandest extension is still alive and, and vice versa. You get that? That's the beauty of the, the whole thing. What other questions? Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is a, a, a real typical question. You, the question is, you have a horse that is insanely heavy. How do you make them light in your hands? So the thing is that the horse that's insanely heavy has obviously not gotten the fact that when you close your fingers on the rein, they're supposed to yield, right? It's a basic thought. I mean, stopping is of huge importance, isn't it? because otherwise you're you know, going to be down at the other showgrounds. So it doesn't matter how many times you breathe in, sit against the horse's motion, tighten your upper leg a bit, close your fist, and he goes, I'm not stopping for anything, and you say, stop. Close your fist into the withers, make him pull against his own body weight almost, right here, like this, see? So you're like a statue, and you say, you're going to stop. And he says, okay, I'll stop. And you say, good boy, good boy. Walk five more steps, take in the breath. Ho, good boy. And then start to get to where he goes. Mm. He yields, good boy, good boy. That may take, it doesn't matter a thousand times, but on the thousandth and first, when he's yielding and, and beginning to yield, and you've said good so many times that he goes, you know what, it was only about that. You mean, I was making up this whole big thing, defending myself, because see, that, the reason they do those things a lot of times is to, they either are naturally balanced so forward that they can't balance on their hind legs to make themselves light, or they don't understand the idea of it and therefore don't want to. They'd rather let you become their fifth leg, you see? in your hands. So you have to say, sorry, but just like when I said, when I, when I drive with my aides, you better go forward. This isn't like a multiple choice question where you can go, ah, I don't feel like it today. Talk to me next Thursday. When you close your fist, you say stop. And, you, and, and the stop can be, it doesn't matter how many times, but then it becomes part of, as I drive and I close my fist, he says, oh yeah, but I yield here because mom's told me to yield here a zillion times, and every time I've yielded, she said, good boy. And so now I'm going to yield. Oh, and I'm still bending my hind legs. You see what I'm saying? You have to rewire the whole thought into lightness, suppleness, and the understanding that it is about training reactions. Got it? OK. Anybody else? I think we have, do we have a few more minutes? Right? Yeah, go ahead. Weight, weight is part of your seat. So yes, yeah, sometimes I'll say, sit really heavy into this. And which means, I mean, tighten your seat and with that driving seat, drive into that movement more, okay? It doesn't mean that suddenly you went from weighing 93 pounds to 98 pounds, but you think that thought, okay? Somebody else? Yeah. Oh, I love that question too. So that question was, do you visualize while you're riding or do you visualize before you're riding? If you, if you are a crazy little kid like me, I visualized in my living room, running around, cantering around, doing my entire Grand Prix, even, even yeah, sadly as an adult. <laughs> um, before Olympic Games, but the, the, the way that we ride and the way that we do like the diver is that in every second that we're riding and breathing in and breathing out, we're defining who we believe we are. Does that make sense? And so we're actually, when we're riding, seeing this movie in our minds of ourselves and our horse in the grandest version that we can possibly imagine 
of ourselves doing this art and sport. It, and we're seeing it, as I said, a fraction of a second ahead. So we're creating that which we're seeing inside our third eye, in our, in our head. Do you see? Absolutely. I mean, because that's what, great, that's what great anybody does, right? There would be no great anyone if they didn't believe, if they didn't see themselves as great. So when you're breathing every single day and every single moment, every breath you take, you're breathing out and you are defining who you believe you are. You know, there are, there are riders, there are trainers out there that can't ride at all. But nobody ever let him in on the secret. <laughs> and they've gone to Olympics. You know that? I mean, that's just the truth. And then there are riders who are unbelievably great, but nobody ever let him in on the secret. So they never became anything. And that is something that you've got to always understand. that that in, into any sport, into any art, you have to come at it and say, I want this. I want, you know, the reason for this hour of conversation, and I, I hope you really took it in, because there will be quizzes all through the week, okay? I'll be asking you questions all through the week, especially if I don't see you riding from half alt to half alt. I'll be asking you those things. And so, um, the, the, the person who really got this hour and understood this hour sees that we are defining ourselves and what we, what we look like on our horse but by what we see in this movie in our mind. Because if it's not your movie, whose is it? Right? Is it the horse's movie? If it's the horse's movie, he sees himself out in a field eating grass. If, it's, if, it, if you're going to let somebody else, if it's the judge's movie, if it's the, you know, your trainer's movie only, the problem is the minute the trainer stops training you, whose movie is it? It better be your movie. You're the star, you're the director, and you're the producer of your own movie. And that's not just about horses, is it? That's about life, right? This whole thing is beautiful, and we love it, and it's about horses. But guess what? It's about a lot more than horses. It's about life.